guys understand why they might not want to come back? I mean, this place, it, it looks like a prison camp. It is not a good idea to commit crime with Bitcoin. Someone will be able to trace your path back. Hello. In a conference call riddled with technical difficulties, be helpful. President Trump and Mexican President Peña Nieto announced a framework for a new trade agreement to replace NAFTA and maybe even give it a new name with one fewer country. I like to call this deal the United States Mexico Trade Agreement. I think it's an elegant name. Canada stopped negotiating with the Trump administration, but now will be under pressure to come back to the table. A federal judge has blocked the company trying to make digital blueprints for 3D guns available online. The order, which sides with a lawsuit filed by attorneys general from 19 states and DC, makes it a criminal offense for Defense Distributed to post the designs. The top federal official overseeing student loans has left his role in protest. Seth Frotman penned a resignation letter to Mick Mulvaney, his boss at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, in which he said the Bureau had abandoned the customers it was meant to protect and accused Mulvaney of using the Bureau to, quote, serve the wishes of the most powerful financial companies in America. Flags are flying at half-staff at the U.S. Capitol for Senator John McCain, but for much of today, the flags at the White House were already back at full staff. Then, at around 4 p.m., Trump backtracked, issuing a statement ordering all flags lowered and offering faint praise for McCain, his first since the senator's death. It's been a year since 700,000 Rohingya Muslims began streaming out of northern Rakhine state in Buddhist-majority Myanmar, turning this stretch of Bangladesh into the world's largest refugee camp. Today, the UN released a report saying the Rohingya were fleeing state-sponsored genocide, the most serious charge that the UN can make against a government. The report calls for Myanmar's top generals, including the commander-in-chief, to face prosecution. Myanmar has justified the crackdown as a response to attacks by Rohingya insurgents, and the government continues to deny all accusations of ethnic cleansing. <laughs> Rosina says she was 16 when the soldiers came to her village. They burned homes, tortured and executed the men, and raped the women. She asked to cover her face with a veil and to use a different name. The military says women like Rosina invented their claims. But she lives with the evidence. Rosina fled to the camps with members of her family, relying on limited aid and surviving monsoons and disease outbreaks. Now a 17-year-old single mother, she faces an additional hardship. Her relatives have refused to accept her child. She's now just trying to get by until she can go back to her village in Myanmar. <laughs> Here, refugees live in overcrowded conditions in an already overpopulated country, and Bangladesh is eager to find a long-term solution. In May, the UN secretly brokered a deal between Myanmar and Bangladesh to pave the way for the Rohingya to return. But the refugees weren't consulted. Mohibullah, who was a teacher before he fled Myanmar a year ago, says they want the military to be held to account before they can go back. <laughs> He and his volunteers have been gathering data, images, and eyewitness testimonies in hopes of building a case for the International Criminal Court. How many cases do you know about of, of rape? Rape a day. 1,834 cases. 
According to Mohibullah's records, the village of Tulatoli, also known as Menji, suffered one of the worst massacres. This place. That's Tulatoli. Yeah. And this is where 850 killed, 127 raped. So you're saying it's very organized. The, yeah, the very military organized. says. The commander knows. You don't think they could have been acting yeah, by themselves? Yeah, yeah. They cannot, even they cannot shoot one bullet without order. How do you get any kind of legal justice for that? There's no way to have information about the people who perpetrated this crime. We know that the people. BGB sector four battalion 99 20 2000. So you know which which units? Yeah, this is a unit 99. Now we have enough evidence. We already sent through the Bangladesh to the ICC. What do you want from the ICC? Oh, to take the action according to the law. Like Mohibullah, human rights organizations are also building a case for the ICC. But Myanmar isn't a signatory to the treaty that would put it under the jurisdiction of the ICC and investigators haven't even been given access to northern Rakhine state, where the killings took place. To show us they had nothing to hide, Myanmar's government invited us on a rare trip for foreign journalists. Handlers escorted us through a carefully orchestrated three-day agenda. The first stop was a border district where many Rohingya refugees used to live. Hello, hello, ready, ready. Ready, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> the Rohingya want to return here, provided that the authorities take steps to ensure that the persecution doesn't continue. But right now, this official, an administrator for a district where mass killings took place, won't admit anything like that happened at all. What's your response to claims that there was a deliberate strategy to push the Muslim residents of this area? <laughs> Did you see villages being burned? When we managed to get away from our handlers and convoy, we saw why the Rohingya feel they have little to return to. So we just drove past a site that looked like it used to be a village. We're just going to walk in and see if we can get close to it. These are all places that used to be houses here, but they've been completely destroyed. There's nobody here at all. One of the things we heard about with Rohingya villages in this part of Rakhine State was that they were burned down to make sure that the Rohingya didn't come back. So you can actually see here in the corner, there's some um, ripped up pages of the Quran. So this is definitely what used to be a mosque. We also tried to get to that village of Minji, also known as Tulatoli, where reports said a large-scale massacre took place. So our contacts in the refugee camps in Bangladesh have just sent us over WhatsApp a map of the village of Tulatoli, where they say this massacre took place. They've actually drawn the site of where the mass grave is containing the bodies of those that were killed. We were able to find the crossroads for the village, but our driver refused to turn. So it's Minji. Ah. Minji. Yeah. The handler came back for us when he saw us stop. Okay. So that's that's the turn off for Minji. It's really important that we go there. We'd, we'd, we'd really like to, to see it, and it's a place that we've asked for repeatedly. So this, this time, this time we have no time. Are they hiding something in this place? Is there something they don't want us to see? Nobody goes there. I, I nobody, know, I, nobody I, goes there. I, I, I know, I Why? know that. I know Why? that. Why does nobody go there? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly, but. Well, I, that's why we want to go there, because nobody's been. That's, mm -hmm. that's a place that is important to us. But, but uh, this trip, uh, we are not suddenly changed to plan. We were unable to reach the alleged mass graves, just like other outside observers.
What the officials did want to show is that they had built fully staffed reception centres and were totally prepared to welcome the refugees back. The UN has repeatedly criticised Myanmar authorities for failing to ensure conditions are safe for the Rohingya. But immigration officials say it's not their fault that the refugees haven't returned. Can you guys understand why they might not want to come back? I mean, this place, it, it looks like a prison camp and it's run by the same people that they accuse of persecuting and killing them in the first place. Even if the Rohingya did start to come back, they likely wouldn't get the legal recognition they seek, including citizenship. Myanmar's government actually considers them illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. With Myanmar refusing to acknowledge wrongdoing or the existence of the Rohingya ethnic group, the refugees' future remains uncertain. This is no man's land, a strip on the edge of Myanmar's border with Bangladesh. The 5,000 Rohingya living here would likely be the first to be returned, since they're within Myanmar's boundaries. They know that the government has said they can return, but they remain in limbo, unwilling to leave the country, but too fearful to go back to their villages. Do any of you guys speak English? We think it's still not safe for us. You're afraid of the, the military? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Why? It's still not it's still not chant against the perpetrator. What kind of action? It's according to law, international law. Before. So many, so many people have been killed. Nobody wants to live this bad condition. This is the sound caught by a Twitch live stream on Sunday of a shooter opening fire as players competed in a video game tournament. Jacksonville, Florida's sheriff says two people died and 10 others were shot by David Katz a 24-year-old from Baltimore who then killed himself. They said he used a handgun he purchased legally in Maryland. Florida's governor found himself weighing in on yet another mass shooting. We need to really just stop and start praying about why, um, why young men, why this is happening to young men. Scott offered prayers, but no actual commitments, a sign he doesn't want to get wrangled up in the gun debate again. Two of the 10 deadliest shootings in modern U.S. history have happened in Florida, while Scott was governor. In 2016, after a shooter killed 49 people at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando with two legally purchased high-capacity weapons, Scott didn't want to talk about gun control. The shooter had pledged allegiance to ISIS, and Scott focused on that. We're going to destroy ISIS. We're going to stop radical Islam. Florida Democrats tried to hold a special session to pass legislation that would have prevented people on a terror watch list from buying guns. But Republicans prevented it. Less than two years later, a teenager with a semi-automatic rifle targeted a school in Parkland, Florida, killing 17. This time, nudged by survivors, Scott's message was different. Everything's on the table. And he didn't just respond with words. In March, Scott signed a bill that included raising the minimum age for buying a gun from 18 to 21, creating a waiting period for most gun buyers, banning bump stocks, and tightening measures for those with mental health problems. The NRA sued, but gun control advocacy groups, including the Giffords Law Center, which had previously given Florida an F for its gun laws, were pleasantly surprised. Florida made significant gains in its gun safety laws this year, and we applaud 
um, Governor Rick Scott and the rest of the state legislature for that. Florida still has a long way to go to enacting some of the most common sense gun laws like background checks on private sales and regulations of assault weapons. Even if you wanted to, right now, Scott probably won't have an opportunity or a motive to enact more gun control legislation. Florida's legislative session just ended, and they're unlikely to reconvene. He's also one day away from a primary for U.S. Senate, and a few months away from what's expected to be a competitive general election. Any shift to the left could piss off people he needs support from, like the NRA. There was so much news this weekend, most people just totally missed that there was a meeting of the Democratic National Committee going on in Chicago. Aye. Members there made a small Close. but important decision. The eyes overwhelmingly have it, and the report and the chart, the call, is adopted. Drastically cutting the importance of what the party calls superdelegates. In 2016, Democrats selected their nominee using two kinds of delegates. The first are pledge delegates. When you vote in a Democratic caucus or primary, you're actually voting for a delegate who will go to the Democratic convention and pledge to vote for the candidate he or she is assigned to based on the state's primary vote total or caucus result. The second kind of delegates Democrats use are the so-called superdelegates. These are delegates with the superpower of having been elected to office or holding a role in the party. So like Bill Clinton, superdelegate, Chair of the Democratic Party in Illinois, superdelegate. Until now, they could vote for whoever they wanted to at the convention. Superdelegates are literally the Democratic establishment. Pledge delegates represent the regular old Democratic voter, which as you might imagine, made the superdelegates issue a key flashpoint in the Democrats' ongoing civil war. At the start of the 2016 primary, Hillary Clinton had the support of just about every superdelegate. She was the establishment pick after all. So when Bernie Sanders announced his bid, he had no superdelegates. That meant when this process started in Iowa, Clinton had a huge lead already. The supers for the most part stuck with Clinton through the entire primary. That left a lot of Bernie people feeling like the system was rigged against them, a perception that has lingered for about three years now. So over the weekend, committee members voted to unrig things, or at least try to end the perception that things are rigged. In 2020, superdelegates will only be able to use their superpower if no one candidate has enough pledge delegates to win the nomination outright. That means the convention has to move to a second ballot. Superdelegates can now only use their power in that second ballot. This is a change all sides of the Bernie Clinton debate can believe in, at least at the party activist level. Michael Blake is a vice chair of the DNC and an elected member of the State Assembly of New York, a superdelegate. He's happy. I do think this allows us to heal and move forward. And I equally think that the fall of 2018 being a first national opportunity where everyone can exercise their energy simultaneously will be the next opportunity for us to heal. Nomiki Koenst is a big time Bernie person and one of the people the Bernie side chose to help reform the DNC. She's happy too. So I think, uh, if anything, it creates a more fair process in that at least the media won't be counting that number, which in turn affects the psychology, it's like how polls do sometimes, right? Um, the psychology of voter turnout in some states, which affects delegate count, the regular delegate count. Ultimately, you know, this should be the party of the grassroots. We shouldn't be anointing anybody. What is Bitcoin? It's a technology that enables people to move money around anonymously. It's harder to trace and it's so anonymous. 100% untraceable. People like to think that Bitcoin is anonymous. Well, good afternoon. But buried in last month's special counsel indictment of 12 alleged Russian spies is an explanation of how law enforcement tracked and identified the suspects using their cryptocurrency transactions. The defendants used a network of computers around the world, and they paid for it using cryptocurrencies. 
one blockchain developer was also able to trace Bitcoin purchases back to Russia's intelligence agency, the GRU, using only public information. He agreed to show Vice News how almost anyone with a Bitcoin wallet could do something similar. It is not a good idea to commit crime with Bitcoin because the moment you have one single weak link in your operational security, all of your history is now exposed. As we've seen in case after case, indictment after indictment, where they're shutting down drug trading, exchanges that are um, operating illegally, it's not just traceable, it's trivial to trace these things. The Russian agents working on behalf of the GRU used Bitcoin as part of the Mueller investigation. Exactly, as part of the Mueller investigation. It lists out um, several counts. Count 10 very specifically talks about how these Russian operatives from the GRU used Bitcoin, amongst other cryptocurrencies, to buy services needed to perform the alleged hacking. There was a very specific call out for a certain transaction amount that occurred on a specific date. And when you went back into the blockchain and looked at it, you can literally say, all right, there was a transaction for 0.026043 Bitcoin. That's a very specific number, right? So you're saying that because you looked in the indictment and saw the exact amount of Bitcoin that they right. used, that Russian agent was the only one to spend that exact amount of Bitcoin in that, that 24 time. hour period. Right, exactly. At that time. What if you wanted to trace back my Bitcoin payments? Do you think you could do that? If you gave me some starting data, yes. So let, let's try it. Okay. So I think I have like $30 in Bitcoin here. Sure. So this VPN here costs $4.95. That's a very specific Bitcoin amount. It's already on the blockchain. This is the destination you sent it to. This is the address it was sent from. I can see that this wallet actually had transfers of Bitcoin from this wallet here, an intermediate wallet. This is not an exactly a normal address. If you look at the number of transactions, it has 118 transactions related to it. And in fact, this looks like Coinbase. The first thing a law enforcement might do is say, okay, this looks like an exchange. I should go see if I have a record of this and any other transactions we've looked at. If it is an exchange, we go subpoena the exchange. Suddenly, I know your name address because you had to submit your driver's license to start buying the coin in the first place. So because all these transactions are listed and they're all verified by encryption and right. math, sure. All you can really hope to do is obscure your footsteps, right? Someone with enough time and dedication will be able to trace your path back. Let's say I'm using Bitcoin, but I'm like, you know, the feds, they just keep <laughs> getting me. What, what is better than Bitcoin? Cash is probably your best bet for anonymity. Why is cash better? As in real life, if you go meet someone in a dark alley um, and you hand over cash and there's not a camera nearby, transaction is over. It's so nice and symmetrical just to have one right there. Right. I think if we get two, we're gonna just have to put them in storage or something. Yeah. Also, they're, I mean, I don't know if you've seen an Emmy. They're two like angel women who are like yes. this. It's gorgeous. So I think I could have the two angel women speaking to each other, which would make my office pass the Bechdel test. Tonight, voting closes for the 70th annual Primetime Emmys. And Megan Amram, a renowned writer on Parks and Rec, Silicon Valley, and The Good Place, is up for two awards in categories that have nothing to do with that work. Action. Hi, my name is Megan Amram, but a fictionalized version of myself for this web series. I was watching the Emmys last year, and there was a category called Outstanding Actress in a Short Form Comedy or Drama Series. And I thought to myself, wow. I could win that. There are 119 Primetime Emmy Award categories, and Amram cherry-picked the most obscure ones, then crafted a web series about her desperation for an Emmy. <laughs> what point does real Megan end and fictional Megan begin? Where's the line? I would say that definitely something fictional Megan and real Megan share is that we both really want an Emmy. I'm so blown away by how many people have been like, Megan, do you actually want an Emmy or is this like a big joke? I'm like, no, of course it's not a joke. 
Of course I want the Emmy. I don't know how many more times I can say it. I've said it in the title, the web series. I said it hundreds of time in the web series. But I don't want an Oscar, I want an Emmy. My life would be fine without having an Emmy, but it would be markedly better if I had one. Is this a fucking intervention? The series yeah. cost Amram about $5,000 and lasts a total of 30 minutes. It's been viewed over half a million times, but given her ultimate goal, that's barely relevant. The very fun thing about this has been that we shot an Emmy for Megan in one day, and then I've spent weeks now and so much money trying to publicize an Emmy for Megan. All in, she spent more than $12,000 on stands, lawn signs, and flyers. I really have no idea who will be showing up to this. Oh, there it is, oh my God. There, do you see it? It's right there. And there is a line of people. This is amazing. Oh, wow. I really crushed it, didn't I? I hope you're here for the signing and not just hanging out on the street. I am so excited that all these people are here. Thank you all for coming. We have good contingency plans if the fire station tells us to get off their property. It truly like has now started blurring the lines of what even is the joke anymore? I'm actually just sitting here signing things. I don't know. <laughs> what are you going to do with those signs? Um, we're going to go to a concert it. and we're going we're to hold them up. No <laughs> way. Do you, want, do you want to know what concert? Yes, of course. <laughs> Nile Horn from one Oh my God. <laughs> For all of Amram's campaigning, she's hardly a sure thing. She's up against short-form web series from James Corden, Grey's Anatomy, and The Walking Dead. If I lose, I mean, I'm not going to, like, make a scene. I'm going to be happy for whoever wins. But I've learned a lot from this year, and I will be coming back even bigger and better. I really want young girls in America to know that they can just ask for what they want. You don't need anyone to be there to say that it's okay to do something. You just need to read the rules and make sure you follow them so you don't get disqualified. But then you just surround yourself with people who believe in you and you just do everything. And I mean that. You can just go do whatever you want and uh, just make sure you think of it before anyone else does.